Hello there and welcome to the second of our tutorials uh, looking at an introduction to systemic pathology. Last time we had a look at upper GI pathology and today we're going to have a look at lower GI pathology. Um, if you haven't watched the first of our tutorials I recommend you start from the beginning um, but if you just want to look at lower GI pathology then this is your best bet. So you can always follow us on Twitter at bite size path, that was an error in our last video, it said at bite size pathology, it's not, it's bite size path. And of course you can always click the subscribe button. So what are we going to have a look at today? Well, first of all we're going to look at the common types of inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. And we're going to look specifically at their microscopic and microscopic pathology and talk a little bit about how that leads to the clinical presentations. We're then going to look at some of the key clinical features of IBD. Then we're going to look at the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program in the UK, um, who it includes and steps that are involved for patients. And from there, we're going to look at some common risk factors for colorectal cancer, look at the adenoma carcinoma sequence for developing colorectal carcinoma, and then finally summarize some of the key clinical features of colorectal carcinoma and how the pathology links to the clinical presentation. So to start with, we're going to look at inflammatory bowel disease. Now, there are two major classifications of IBD, and that's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, or UC. Now, these affect one in every 250 people in the UK, and that equates to about 300,000 people. Um, and importantly, about 50% are in their teens and 20s. Now, these are lifelong conditions that account for a significant amount of morbidity and they can be completely, and indeed are, completely life-changing. So understanding their pathology, understanding what's going on, and aiming towards trying to cure these diseases is very important to us. Now, we are still not completely sure what causes inflammatory bowel disease. All we know is that there is an autoimmune element, and that it's likely to be multifactorial with immune, environmental, and genetic factors. So the two types of IBD, how do you distinguish between them? Well, we can do it clinically. Um, in general, we tend to say that ulcerative colitis is confined to the colon. Um, patients will present usually quite acutely with abdominal pain and a change in bowel habits. Now, this can involve patients going to the toilet um, a huge amount of times in a day. And particularly important in the presentation of UC is a description of bloody diarrhea. And when we compare this to the clinical presentation of Crohn's disease, this can actually present anywhere in the GI tract. It can affect anywhere from what we call the mouth to the anus. And uh, typical symptoms are sort of cramping abdominal pain and bloating. It may be associated with weight loss as well, and again, a change in bowel habit. The patients, though, will be more likely to describe watery diarrhea than bloody diarrhea. So when you hear bloody diarrhea, um, from a patient in their history, then it's slightly more indicative of ulcerative colitis. Of course, you can't always apply that rule because everybody will present slightly differently. But these are some of the clinical features of an IBD presentation. And we'll look at why this is happening now. So, of course, we can distinguish between these pathologically. And here we're looking at some uh, microscopic and macroscopic pathology of Crohn's disease. Now, Crohn's disease affects the entire bowel wall. So that includes the mucosa, it includes the connective tissues underneath, it includes the um, muscular tissues underneath as well. And we, we give this posh word, we talk about transmural inflammation. Um, so transmural inflammation means that the whole of the bowel wall is being affected. Um, another key finding in Crohn's disease is um, the formation of what we call granulomas. Now, granulomas are collections of giant epithelioid cells, and these are really specialized types of macrophages. Um, so these are immune cells that are essentially responding to something, and they're trying to wall something off. So this has led to lots of theories as to how Crohn's disease would start, but essentially you find these granulomas in the bowel wall. And that's indicative and diagnostic of Crohn's disease when it comes to looking and diagnosing uh, this under the microscope from a biopsy. Another really important feature of Crohn's disease is the finding of a cobblestone pattern, which you can see very nicely in this um, colonic resection image here. Now, what you tend to find is there's areas of the 
bowel wall that are affected and then there'll be quite a clear demarcation where the bowel wall isn't affected. So you go from a, an area of the wall affected by Crohn's disease to nothing and then an area of the wall affected by Crohn's disease and we call those skip lesions. So those areas that are affected, normal areas of, of bowel wall and then another affected area. So we refer to that as skip lesions and this cobblestoning and skip lesion pattern you can often see on radiology as well. So the really important features that you need to know pathology wise, particularly if you were given a description of, of Crohn's disease are involvement of the whole bowel wall, so that's transmural inflammation, the appearance of granulomas which is indicative of Crohn's disease and also this skip lesion pattern or cobblestoning pattern. The commonest site for Crohn's disease to occur is actually in the terminal ileum. And we talk about terminal ileitis um, being there, but the sort of the, the, the ileocecal area is really important for Crohn's disease. Now you can imagine when you've got this level of inflammation going on and burrowing through the bowel wall, this can then lead to obviously fibrotic reactions to try and repair those areas that have been damaged. And that will lead to inflammatory strictures, so you could get bowel obstruction as a result of Crohn's disease and that can be a presentation of Crohn's disease and also you can get fistulas forming so that's an, a connection between two body cavities that shouldn't really be there so two uh, spaces that shouldn't be linked are formed by a little bridge and that's because you're getting this inflammation burrowing through so fistulas and strictures are two important complications that can arise as a result of Crohn's disease. And again, it can affect anywhere, including around the anus. So you can get um, uh, anal fissures, you can get ulcerations around the, um, the anus as well, and some very, very difficult perianal disease and abscess formations there. And, and also you can get alphas ulcers, which are sort of ulcerations that can affect the mouth as well. So that's really important to distinguish as well. So when you compare that to ulcerative colitis, ulcerative colitis has this sort of inflammatory hemorrhagic picture when you look at it down the microscope. So you can see that there are some red blood cells um, in the bowel uh, mucosa there on the left hand side. And it's generally confined to the mucosa, so it's not affecting the whole bowel wall um, as Crohn's disease does. You can also find this quite characteristic finding of um, ulceration, but it's different from the ulceration that you'll see in Crohn's disease. So in Crohn's disease, we see something called serpentine ulcers. You don't really get that in ulcerative colitis. That tends to be in Crohn's disease, whereas you get sort of gross ulceration in ulcerative colitis. And then you also get um, what's called a crypt abscess in ulcerative colitis. So you can see on the image on the right here, we're looking at a cross section uh, through bowel wall and we're looking here at colonic crypts. You can see all these goblet cells. Um, and you can see a collection in the crypt in the middle of inflammatory cells in the middle of one of those crypts, at the base of one of those crypts. And we call that a crypt abscess. So inflammation that's confined only to the bowel mucosa, crypt abscess appearance, that's much more indicative of, it, of IBD. And you can see from that image on the left, why somebody's going to present with bloody diarrhea because you're getting ulceration and basically um, peeling off of the upper mucosa and that's going to bleed. And as a result, you'll get some of this um, bloody diarrhea as a, as a um, presentation. It's also different in the fact that ulcerative colitis is mostly confined to the colon. In fact, it is confined to the colon. And you get some people that are affected with just proctitis. So most of it's confined only to the rectal areas. You get left-sided uh, distal colitis. And you can get total colitis, where there's involvement of the entire colon. And in patients that have total colitis, you can get um, the terminal ileum being affected as well, and you get what's called backwash ileitis. So because of all the inflammation and nasty changes that are going on in the colon, that sort of um, transfers back a little bit, as it were, um, to the terminal ileum, and that can become edematous as well. But ulcerative colitis, unlike Crohn's disease, is confined only to the colon. And the image on the far right side here is showing you a very, very badly damaged and inflamed colon um, that's been taken out from somebody who had ulcerative colitis. And many of these patients will end up having what's called a subtotal colectomy. So you take, a, you take out practically all of the colon um, and give them uh, an ileostomy. And so they end up with a stoma as a result of this. So just 
the key points to do with that really are that Crohn's disease is characterized by inflammation of the whole bowel wall with granulomas and you get these skip lesions and serpentine ulcers. Whereas ulcerative colitis, the inflammation is generally confined to the bowel mucosa. It will only affect um, the colon and you get cryptabscess formation as well. Now that's the pathology of IBD. What I'm not talking about in this tutorial for the um, interest of brevity are some of the uh, systemic manifestations of IBD and hopefully we'll cover that in, a, in another tutorial but there are a number of uh, extra systemic um, manifestations uh, of inflammatory bowel disease. So colorectal cancer. Now colorectal cancer is, is common in the UK. Um, it tends to affect men more than it affects women. You can see that in 2014 there's about just over 40,000 cases. A significant amount of uh, death as a result of colorectal cancer. But survival has significantly improved in recent years thanks to the introduction of a bowel cancer screening program in the country. So how do colorectal cancers develop? Well, you start off with normal bowel mucosa and you expose that to a variety of different things such as a westernized diet, maybe some genetic factors, and you acquire some mutations. And that can lead to the development of a polyp. That's a benign tumour and that we would call a colorectal adenoma. Now what's shown here is, is a polyp with a stalk, that's what we call a pedunculated polyp, but you can get a flat polyp called a sessile polyp as well. The problem is that adenomas have a tendency to acquire even more mutations and the more they're exposed to a variety of different environmental and genetic factors, the more mutations they acquire. And that will then lead to the development of an invasive cancer, and that's an adenocarcinoma. So this is deriving from glandular tissue. Um, and essentially you have this sequence from a normal mucosa to forming a polyp, an adenoma, acquiring more mutations, which then cause that tumour to become malignant. And we call this the adenoma carcinoma sequence. And molecular pathology is very interested um, in targeting some of those mutations and some of the pathways that are involved in that sequence. So things such as uh, KRAS and BRAF mutations are particularly important. And I'd encourage you to have a look at those if you're interested. So why do we screen? Well, given that that process is going on, what we want to try and do is catch these adenomas um, in the early stages so we can stop them from developing into a full-blown cancer. So we do something in the UK, the National Bowel Cancer Screening Programme, and from the age of 60, men and women are invited to give a sample of uh, their faeces uh, on this thing called a hemoscreen, um, which is a faecal occult blood test. So this is looking for um, hidden bits of blood, essentially, uh, in the feces. All it takes is a couple of scrapes on those panels which are then sent off to the lab and tested. If that test comes back positive then people are offered a uh, sigmoidoscopy to have a look and if they find a polyp in that um, setting then they can take it out. It will be sent off for a biopsy, you can make sure that there's nothing suspicious there and of course if there are suspicious lesions then you can biopsy them there and then and the ball can start rolling in trying to get that person uh, treated as soon as possible. So this has made significant advances and has had a significant effect in reducing the mortality from colorectal cancer in this country. So what are the risk factors for colorectal cancer? Well we know that a western diet that comprises a very low fiber content but high starch content seems to be an important factor. Smoking is of course a risk factor for, for most cancers, particularly colorectal cancer. Obesity is a significant problem. Again, that could be linked to the westernized diet. If you have inflammatory bowel disease, where well, you've got rapidly um, overturning cells and chronic inflammation going on, which is in itself a risk factor for the development of cancer. Alcohol use seems to be an important risk factor as well. And family history is important and I want to talk about a couple of conditions, a couple of genetic conditions that are inheritable that seem to have a significant impact on uh, um, developing colorectal cancer. Now it's very interesting that people have looked at what factors decrease the risk of colorectal cancer and um, there's some um, debate and research going on into the use of aspirin and whether regular aspirin will reduce the risk of colorectal cancer but the results of of, of most of those studies aren't really very clear yet, um, so that's not being recommended at, at the moment. 
but it certainly could be an important factor and also increasing the fibre in your diet seems to be quite important as well for getting away from that western red meat diet. So colorectal cancer does seem to be in the genes and there are two conditions which predispose you to developing colorectal cancer. The first is a condition called familial adenomatosis, poly, sorry, familial adenomatous polyposis, it's called FAP, and this predisposes you to making many, many polyps. Now it's due to a mutation in something called the APC gene, the adenomatous, adenomatous polyposis coli gene. Um, and this essentially is where your two hit hypothesis with uh, genes in the development of cancer comes in. Most people inherit a mutated form of the APC gene that have this condition and then the second allele uh, tends to become mutated and then predisposes to developing the full-blown condition. Now th these people develop hundreds and thousands of polyps in the colon and therefore their risk of those changing into a colorectal cancer thanks to that adenoma carcinoma sequence is very, very high. Practically all of them, just over 90%, will develop carcinoma by the age of 50. And so as a result of that, most people will have a prophylactic colectomy um, and they'll take out the colon. The second condition that's important is hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. I apologise, I can't pronounce these today. But this is, is called Lynch syndrome. This is an inherited form of colorectal cancer and it's due to mutations in DNA mismatch repair genes that result in microsatellite instability in the genome. And that essentially means that repair processes don't go as they should do and as a result colorectal cells acquire a variety of mutations that then predispose to cancer formation. There's also a propensity to forming other cancers, so in women, ovarian and endometrial cancers are important as well, so they tend to come um, all together. And again, um, if a patient has a family history, a strong family history of colorectal cancer, then you might want to consider whether these could be um, potential diagnoses in these families. But the two important ones to know about are familial adenomatous polyposis and hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer. So we talked about what causes colorectal, well, risk factors for colorectal cancer and potential causes of them. How do they present? Well, the classic thing that we're told to look for as changes in bowel habit and uh, any form of PR bleeding or blood in the stool that's mixed in particularly with the stool. Um, the majority of colorectal tumours form in the, recto, um, in the rectum and in the sigmoid colon. So that's the most common site. And these tumours will present with PR bleeding, changes in bowel habit, and a feeling of incomplete emptying of the bowels that's called tenesmus. However, there's also a significant proportion, if you look, that present in the cecum. And th these patients are more likely to present with your symptoms of anemia, so iron deficiency anemia, and also weight loss and perhaps um, sort of malnutrition type picture, but also they can present with obstruction because the terminal ileum can become obstructed and they can obstructed and they can have bowel obstruction as a result of that. This is sort of a narrow corner, as it were, in the bowel. So important about this slide is that the majority of rect of colorectal cancers form in the rectus sigmoid area, but and they are the ones that will present with classic symptoms of PR bleeding, change in bowel habit, perhaps mucus in the stool, tenesmus. But also, you have a significant proportion that won't present like that and will in fact present with your symptom of iron deficiency, anemia, weight loss, or could indeed present as an ac acute bowel obstruction and perforation as subsequent to that. So the location of the tumour is important for the clinical presentation. So what have we looked at in this presentation? Well, firstly, we've looked at the common types of inflammatory bowel disease from descriptions of their mic microscopic and microscopic pathology. We looked at some of the key clinical features, but we didn't go through some of the extra systemic manifestations that you can get in those. We looked at the uh, National Bowel Cancer Screening Program in this country and the steps that are involved for that. And then we looked at risk factors for colorectal cancer and how that develops in the adenoma carcinoma sequence. And finally, we just looked at how the site of the tumour affects the key 
clinical presentations of these cancers. I hope that was useful for you. Please feel free to ask questions and leave comments below um, and feel free to tweet us and of course hit the subscribe button. We'll be back with our next instalment which is going to be renal pathology.